one, and we're live. Hi, everyone. I'm here with Dan Lane. Hi, Dan. Hello, everyone. And we are doing a winner's interview because, Dan, you just won a 52-man event at the Welsh Nationals. Yes. Congratulations. Even yeah, though big, uh, officially, officially, are you the, the, the Welsh champion now or not? I couldn't figure that one out. Technically, uh, I I asked Reese after the event to say what qualifies you to make you Welsh to be able to win the championship, and it was, you know, like when you have football players and yeah. you are, are clearly an Argentinian, and it's like, well, his long lost cousin twice removed was Brazilian, so he's playing yeah. for them now. And it's like, oh, okay, yeah. yeah but yeah. my my grandmother is Welsh, but I didn't know that would qualify me until after the event. So Russell. Oh. Russell Wright finished second. Yeah. He is the Welsh champion. Yeah. But I was the event winner, but I technically should be because I technically qualify for Welsh. Could qualify for Welsh. Doesn't yeah. Yeah. No, doesn't matter because you won the gold, which is all we care about here anyway. So yeah. who cares? This is a Se bit, second this is, is just first loser, right? Yeah, that's true. That is true. So, so this is a winner's interview where I'm sort of trying to let people know what it is that people who win events that they yeah. what they do. And um, I recently interviewed uh, Aaron uh, Russell, the Australian champion. You can go on and watch that as soon as this comes out. Uh, that interview will be out as well. So um, so. And and I have sort of like a, a list of questions that I go through and basically we start before an event. Um, so with the list building now, Dan, I know that that you have previously won tournaments using your Americans. Yeah. Um, what happened at the Welsh Nationals? Because you were not using Americans. <laughs> no, I've actually won events with a lot of nations. So I've done yep. Americans, Belgians, French, uh, Finnish, Italians. So this event, because I knew a lot of the players that were going. I know a lot of the players are British mains. So yeah. people like Topher was taking Brits, Rich Soresco was taking Brits. Um, Gary Morgan is a big American player, but he plays yeah. very similar style to British lists. Russell is usually a very big British player. So I knew once you get past the first one round, because that's where you can't control it. So you yeah. may have just a random draw against yeah. a Japanese player or whatever. So as long as you build a list that could win that game, even by a small margin, I mm -hmm. knew I would have a good chance of playing nothing but Brits for the rest of the day. Lo and behold, I played nothing but Brits for the rest you of the did. event. You did? That's four games of Brits. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I played four games wow. of Brits. And one, one American. Um, and the British lists were pretty much all identical. And mm. having so, so built like my... four Gurkhas, one uh, engineer, and a steward. Well, or... it, yeah. it was some variant of infantry yeah. in a bread carrier with yeah. a couple of DACA tanks to back it up. And then maybe mm. a couple of armored cars. Like a, I think one of the lists had a Staghound and a Humber. Mm. The other one had two Humbers. Yeah. But yeah, they're, they're all pretty much cookie yeah. cutter list um yeah so i built my french list to be good enough to take on a random list first mm. and then i just tailored it to beat the meta list and it absolutely demolished them every single game it was yeah it worked perfectly so so going into this you actually prepped to beat british lists is that right is that is that what yeah. I'm, yeah yeah exactly that i, I built this list I, I knew that all of the British lists that would be going would be around about 18 dice. So I knew yeah. I needed to outnumber them by at least five or six. So I took 25. Yeah. The highest British list I played was 20 dice. Mm. Um, so you always had the, the order dice uh, advantage. Always had the order dice advantage. And yeah. because I've got so many units, I knew that I had enough units to be able to just go down across the entire board and still have units left over so that after he's activated everything, mm. I've still got units to be effective to things like add tank rifles to move onto the flanks and shoot brands, or I've got howitzers to pin infantry that have moved up and shot, but now can't go down. Yeah. And it, it worked like a charm. It was really, really effective. One thing that I think a lot of, of people viewing this will be curious is, 
um, the meta like right now is pretty much bridge. You're going Gurkhas. You're going to go veteran Gurkhas, uh, possibly even para Gurkhas, with a couple of darker stewards and an armored car or like whatever. You fill out the blanks from that, and and you say that you you build it to tailor your list to, to defeat that. Is what what do you think is is necessary to to win against these Gurkha lists? So. In my list, I had to take enough. Well, first of all, the first thing in my list was two snipers yeah. because I can kill the enemy mortars, which first game my opponent took two in X mortars because he listens to Bo Mortensen's <laughs> YouTube videos. You never should I, do that. <laughs> no, I kill both of them. I kill both of them in the first two turns. Um, oh, that sucks. <laughs> but against all the British players, I know because I've got so many order dice, my first couple of dice out are going to shoot his observer. Mm. And then he doesn't have any control of the battlefield. Then I build the list after that to be as many tank rifles as you can fit in. So I took okay. tank rifle teams and I took two of the early war bikes with tank rifles on them. Just because I know that I can hide them, mm. wait for him to activate a lot of his stuff, and then pop around the side and shoot friends, get people hope, out of them. Hope for a kill, yeah. Hope for the kill. Make them take pins if they don't. But if they get out of if they if the friend dies, they take hits as well. So it's mm. two for one, right? But also yep. guess what Stuart's are? Vulnerable. Yep. So you zip they are, up the side. It's pretty easy inches. to kill in the side with an anti tank rifle. Yeah, yeah, with a plus four in the side from yeah. a tank yeah. rifle, which is yeah. forty five points on a bike for twelve inch mm. movement, suddenly mm. Stuart's are actually quite crap. Yeah. Um, so I've got those in. The next thing I needed was bodies. Mm -hmm. And the French have a lot of NX troops and you get more of them for free. So I filled yeah. that quota, got the extra squad. So I had 40 inexperienced dudes. I then had a bunch of cav. I had three mm -hmm. squads of six. One for hunting down Brens that have got things like officers in. Because yeah. the amount of times you would just leave an officer in a Bren just to shoot the machine guns. Well, guess what? I'm going to get you out of it. Yeah. If I kill the officer, yeah. the Bren's probably going to die next turn as well. Yeah. Um, and then the last thing I've got is howitzers. Mm. I've got three of them because mm. you you don't even need to kill them. As long as you hit them once, they're done for the entire game because you yep. put pins on them. They then have to rally. And once you've hit them, you're hitting them on twos every turn. Mm. And you're just going to keep them where they are. I think in the last game against Toph, I hit with my heavy howitzer against his Lee on yeah. turn one put seven pins on it he then oh. revert he failed a failed a rally check and reverse then had to yeah. rally again oh, so that's he was, a waste out, of he was time. out of the game yeah. yeah he was out of the game for three yeah. turns and after oh. he rallied he still had four pins on him because i had the tank rifle just go in have a pin have thing, a pin thing, have thing, a pin yeah. and it just kept him out of the game and he couldn't do anything so it's, it's all about having the redundancy to go down yeah. and still activate what you need to activate but you've built your list to have as many tools as possible so that yeah. no matter what goes down you always have a card or a hand to play to say well you've done this i can do that or mm. you've done the other thing i can reveal this hand instead so it's all about that balance it's uh, like f because for me i often think about bold action in terms of different play styles um yeah um and i think i've I, as a player, am, am one who, who likes to go in, into the extreme of, of one play style. Uh, so for the longest time, I've been playing assault uh, units and assault armies. Um, do you feel like you're a, a person that, that likes to play with a, a toolbox list that has like a little bit of everything? So you always have something for the, the, the individual situations that you find yourself in? Or how do you think about that um yeah is that I, like I, off off your uh nah, well me and bolt action combats have have a very checkered history yeah so i'm i'm the kind of person in bolt action where i would charge a 10-man squad into a sniper team and lose oh yes and, that happens <laughs> that yeah happens. so and that's happened quite a lot actually so <laughs> I tend not to build my lists to make contact. Mm. Bolt action is very much a shooting game. If you make contact with the enemy, you're kind of in trouble. Um, so I usually build a list to kind of 
cover all bases apart from combat. But mm. this French list, because of the amount of bodies it had and because all the cav are tough fighter, it was yeah. very much a list of it needs to get into combat because inexperienced yeah. troops aren't ever going to hit. No. They're just so bad. But what are they good at? Running forward, going down, yeah. and dying. <laughs> and yeah. that's, that's about it. So I just... Mm when i had the opportunity all my cab all my infantry run forward into cover go down when they get shot and then as soon as anything gets close enough you pounce on it and and, and chop it up but usually for my americans i like to play with a bit of a blended list so i like to have a lot of long range firepower to keep you at bay but mm. once it gets close enough i like to have units that can pounce out and then just put so much firepower at a close range it just obliterates whatever it touches but without that risk of, oh crap, I rolled a bunch of ones in combat, I'm now dead. Yeah, but that's um, what you can do with Americans, isn't it? Because Americans yeah. are, are brilliant at that. Um, did you find it uh, difficult to change over to using French uh, here in, in this one? Because you've used a lot of other armies, you said, like uh, Belgians are very similar yeah. to French. Yeah. Yeah, but Belgians, the only thing they don't have is any anti tank. Mm. Um, but I, I used them at a 1250 event with a dice cap, which was 15, 14 or 15 dice. So I took a bunch of veteran tough fighters um, and they worked yeah. really well getting in combat again. So maybe I'm just crap at combats and I should have been doing it all along. Um, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> yeah. But like my, my Finnish army, for instance, is one that is very much you stay on your side of the board i'm gonna stay here, I'll stay here and i'll shoot uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah and don't come any closer or i will shoot and then if they do move you you obviously can yeah. take them apart quite easily but it it wasn't too hard switching my play style up because obviously my american list is hyper aggressive it yeah. is literally turn one in your face barbecue everything mm. rifle shots out of the wazoo um and the french list was pretty similar except for you don't shoot you just declare charges as much as you can yeah. and you use the howitzers to uh pin big units in place by making them go down disrupt mm. the enemy vehicles by making them recce away or putting loads of pins on them and the tank rifles are just there to be annoying and of course with the two ft-17s and i've also got two of them uh, machine gun bikes as well you can use those a bit like the american list where you can pick up a spot and just say right four machine guns are going that way yeah and you pick a unit pin, pins, pin, 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 yeah, yeah. make it do something other than be effective and then you can concentrate your forces elsewhere yeah brilliant so going into to a tournament like the welsh nationals here um how do you how do you uh, how do you approach going into a tournament like that um is there is there like something you do before a tournament how do you prep for that um it, it's it's weird actually because for most tournaments i kind of think like like a top football team for instance like a man city or a real madrid or something mm. you always say that they impose themselves and their play style on the game so no matter yeah. who manchester city play for instance it could be liverpool at the top of the table or it could be burnley at the bottom of the table they want to play their game and their yep. style and that's what i've always done mm. i've always said this is the list i'm taking i'm going to win just by figuring it out on the day but for mm. this event i very much thought now nah, this is this is going to get absolutely demolished by british gurkha stuart spam what i'm going to do is i'm yep. going to switch it up i'm going to think about what the british players are likely to take so mm. i did my research and i did a little bit of thinking of what i've seen in the past what i saw at the wtc we did mm. this the stats episodes on the jugger podcast for stuff like that as well um and then how do I can counter that? So then I yep. got my army books out and I looked at my Japanese book and I thought, okay, well, I can do this, but it's not going to be effective. I can do this with my fins. Again, it's not going to be too effective. And then I decided on Belgians or French. And I thought, well, Belgians are just worse French. So let's take French. <laughs> True. <laughs> because when I, when I decided on those two, I thought, well, the French get the machine gun bikes and the Belgians don't. And that's what yep. swung it. And that is that is the major difference for me as well between yeah. Belgians and French. The the machine gun bikes, the the early war motorbikes, they are brilliant. Yeah, yeah, I, I, it all came down to that. So as soon as I figured that bit out, I thought, right, I have French. Let's see what I need. So I developed a list and then mm. rewrote it twice. Um, one of them had uh, a bunch of veteran infantry in in transports, and I thought, 
it's not going to be effective enough. It's not. Mm. Uh, so I think I had the the Gourmiers in the the seven plus cars that fit like eight men in. I can't yes. remember the name of it off the top of my head. Yeah, very lays or something like Early that. Early yeah. yes, yeah. that's the one. And when I wrote that, I thought hey, it just looks too similar to the British lists that are going to be going and they're going to be better at it than me. So let's yeah, go back are. to the drawing board. So we stripped it all out, kept the things I knew I wanted, which is your three cav squads. I wanted the machine gun bikes, the tank rifle bikes, the FT-17 and all the howitzers. And then mm. from that point on, I filled in all the rest. Um, ended up needing to print out a couple of athlete trucks just to put two engineer squads in them. So you've got that yeah. flamethrower threat. Yeah. I I can't leave home without flamethrowers. You know. <laughs> They're my crutch. Um, yeah, they are. They are a little bit. I, I don't know uh, people out out there. I don't know how much you follow the Jogger podcast. You should, but but Dan is is a little bit famous for his barbecue lists, and, and yeah, he really can can play them. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. So and that that's where I ended up. You see, so that was my preparation for the event. Yeah. It was to do my research, go through all of the army books, go through all of think right well he's allowing all units that have the magic sentence of this can be used in a yeah so i went through everything and we've got notes we've got a jugger pack for instance that tells you and the wtc pack that we use mm -hmm. tells you what units have that keyword yeah. and where they can be used so i i did my homework picked the army that i wanted to do and then wrote a couple of lists out designed it specifically to beat the and it worked it was mm. perfect the, the only game that i didn't win was my second game against dutch because they had 27 order dice to my 25 and it was a very <laughs> similar list it was yeah. a bunch of artillery loads of nx dudes and then a few yeah. machine gun vehicles to pin everything in place that and was that was felix from germany yeah right? that was felix yeah. yeah 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 he is brilliant i mean that, that was just amazing seeing him pop up crop up at the wtc and and just do so well with his his uh dutch yeah his, um, his list is really scary as well yeah it was really yeah. scary yeah um, um so like because you're part of the juggernaut club uh did you guys uh like prep together before a tournament or, or are you going like separate and i know you you played tof in the final game so that yeah. was more or less a jugger jugger off at the at the end there um it was actually because it kind of got me into bolt action a long long time ago when we first started out so it's kind of poetry that my last game of v2 was against yeah we as a club we do usually practice mm. so when we have a big event coming up we will design our lists and we will practice them for a few weeks before list submission we will tweak them around if needed to um we will then submit them immediately regret submitting the list and then worry about it for the two weeks <laughs> up until the event uh, but this event i didn't do any of that so i no. i hadn't i hadn't played bolt action mm. in, and that was in march wasn't Oof. it yeah uh no february i don't I can't remember mm. either way i hadn't played bolt action for about four or five months um yeah and I just figured, well, I'm going, I know what's going to beat the other lists. I've played bolt action enough to know what's going to go. Yeah. And it's like riding a bike, you know, you, it is. you yeah. just pick it back up again. So I, this is going to sound horribly arrogant, but I know that I am one of, if not the best player in the world. So I know that no matter what I use, mm. uh, you know, a rifleman is a rifleman. They do it the is. same job. Yeah. So. Yeah. You, you're always going to be able to know the fundamentals of how every army plays. Yeah. Um, so it's not a massive, a massive upheaval to pick up French rather than the Americans. It's just the little nuances, but you, mm. you, you learn it quickly enough. But I, I, I didn't personally do any practice, but I know a lot of the guys did. So Spurley, Tove, and Pete, they were practicing for mm. at least three or four weeks beforehand, trying out their yeah. list every week to to make it better and. For a, personally, I would normally do that, but for this one, I didn't. I because yeah. I I couldn't get down to club, and when I did get down to club, I wanted to play at the old world because that's my <laughs> number one game. Right. That this is this is so very different because for me, preparation is is like very key for everything I do. Like every single tournament, I I maybe I over prep, I guess. <laughs> but but so uh, hearing you uh, saying that that you didn't really prep at all, and then you you actually do well anyway. That that sounds so weird. But um, well, 
we, we, we are massive, massive advocates on our show for yeah. the player beats the list. Yes. And I'm sure that if I if I came across to Denmark and I played you and yeah. we both got random lists, mm. it would be a close game. It would. Because we're both good players. We know yeah. how bolt action works. We know yeah. the fundamentals of what goes where and where it's supposed to be at a certain time in the game. Yeah. So practice does make perfect, but I do think you can overthink things. So yes, people I, will I, lose their heads over whether yeah. they should take a flamethrower team or a sniper oh, team. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And that's the kind of thing where, mm. you know, I don't, just I, pick one. I don't yeah. really yeah. care. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just yeah. pick one and make it work. If you're going to do something, just pick it on yeah. instinct and say, well, I think this is going to work better. Just yeah. put your neck on the line and use it. Because that was the one thing in my list. I knew I wanted two snipers. Other than that, do what you mm. want. Yeah. But the two snipers had to be there. But that's also one thing. I mean, like list list building is one part of preparation for me, I guess. And then there's the, the missions, uh, reading the missions, thinking about the missions, making a plan for the missions, maybe yeah. reading through the lists and all that. Did you actually do some of that uh, prep uh, before the event? Because I know the list, uh, sorry, the missions were out a little bit later than the pack. Yeah, the, the, the missions came out after submission, yep. which is, I don't care either way. If the missions are in the pack and they come out a variety of missions, mm. that's absolutely perfect because everyone can plan their lists for a nice, well-rounded uh, tournament. That's absolutely mm. fine. Or if you withhold the list so that no one gets an advantage and no one can prep for them, that's kind of okay as well because everyone's in the same boat. It's just yeah. a bit awkward if you spring a new mission on people and it's not worded 100% perfectly yeah, or there's yeah, a little yeah. bit of confusion. Yeah. Um, I personally would err on the side of the first one yeah. where you give everyone all the information and let them go yeah. wild and over prep to their you know yes. their bows level of uh, oh yes play every single thinking. mission twice before the for the, before yeah. the tournament that's what i, I mean, do often <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and when we've yeah. played when i've been part of the wtc team as a player in the past or when we were going to big events like the gts in the past i would absolutely do that i would yeah. read the missions i would plan a list out for all of them i would practice them but obviously for this one the missions were late so we couldn't well not late they were just not given out until after submission on purpose so that no one had an advantage um and i read the, i read the mission pack in the car on the way to the event in the morning um <laughs> but, uh, yes yeah because I, once you look at them you think well heartbreak ridge i've played that before yeah, yeah, engagement i've played that yeah, before yeah. sectors i've played that before yeah. there was only a couple of new ones um yeah. And they were pretty much sectors. So, <laughs> yeah, I heard. Fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So um, then you get to the like we've sort of talked you through what happens before. Um, now you get to the individual game. So you're walking up to a table. What what do you actually do when you walk up to a table and you hear the opponent uh, that that you're going to play what, and and the mission? What what do you do in that process? Um, I I've never been one to put too much stock in a name so yeah. a lot of like my first game was against uh, a lad called charlie who's from the pegasus warlords which are a club down south in england and when i met him i was like hi how you doing nice to meet you i'm dan he was like oh yeah i know who you are mm. uh, i've heard about you and your list is one that we've been discussing on the way up in the car because we heard it when you reviewed it on your podcast yeah and i was a bit like oh okay and in my third or fourth game the player i played said oh no you're done this is going to be a challenge and it's like well if yeah. you've got that kind of attitude already mate you've already lost haven't you yeah that's half the battle for me that is half the battle and um, like oh, and we've done a whole episode on like the psychology of stuff yes. like that and that is loser talk if i yeah, go to an is. event and i go oh god i've got bow oh god. yeah yeah I, I fucking love into... it when that happens. I fucking love it because I know I'm going to win. <laughs> yeah. It, half the ba you, you don't even have to try that hard to win that game because the person you're playing against is already in the mindset of, oh, well, no matter what I do, I'm going to lose. Yeah. So, yeah. But personally, if, if I'm against just like uh, at this event, for instance, they did player numbers rather than player names because it was easier for their scoring system. So it would yeah. be like, you know, player 48 plays player nine. 
and mm. you go well, who the fuck's playing nine and you're looking around and you think <laughs> oh, okay. oh it's you okay yeah. um but when i get to the board the first thing i do is i look at the terrain mm. and even if i have to walk 100 yards down to the end to go round both, through the end of the table both sides of the table yeah i will look at it from both sides and then i will stand on the side i want because nice 99 little times, psychological trick that one 99 times out of 100 even if the person wins yep. they will choose either their edge or yep. one of the two quarters in their deployment zone because people are too lazy to walk around the other side or they're too polite to make you walk the 100 yards to come around the table to the other side or they just see the opportunities on their side and forget to look from the other side and yes. see that the opportunity is actually better from that side yeah and then that, that's actually a really good thing to do when you get to the event in the morning yeah uh, it's walk up and down the rows of tables and just mm -hmm. have a quick scan to yourself and think if i play on this board or that board i want that side that side that quarter yep. that quarter i just and just it only takes 10 15 minutes to walk around quickly in the morning whilst you're doing your registration and it can make a massive difference because there yeah. were a few boards at this event where because you're playing quarters as well if mm. someone got the right quarter and you got forced into the wrong one it would literally lose you the game because you had no cover and Ooh. it was that big a decision Ooh, yeah <laughs> so like when i played toth game five mm -hmm. i won the roll off for sides and I happened to choose, I was on the side with the walls and the buildings and the fences. Yeah. And his table quarter had nothing for the first 18 inches. No. Yeah, yeah. No. Literally nothing. There was like a big 24 inch by 18 square or rectangle yeah. rather that just had no cover. So, of course, I made him deploy in that. It concentrated all of his forces into one yeah. side. And yeah. then I just shot howitzers over there and yeah. pinned it all and kept it all in a nice little bubble. But it can make a massive difference, so that's really important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you you walk through both sides of the list. Uh, sorry, the uh, the the uh, table. So you see the yeah. terrain. Then the opponent approaches the table, and you see his list. Is that the first time you're viewing that list? <laughs> I never look at lists. Nope. Um, if I'm coming up against a Japanese player, I know what it's going to be. It's going to be a a horde of infantry with maybe a few tanks and a couple of suicide anti-tank teams. If I play a British player, you know what you're going to get. If you play an American player, you know it's going to be a bunch of uh, riflemen, few bars, Dakar Stewarts. Mm. I've played enough tournaments now to know what's coming. The only time you ever need to do that is if you go to a, a themed event where they say everyone brings a theatre selector list. Yes. And that, that, that can change, be interesting. That changes everything that can change up. Yeah. It up. Yeah. yeah. Um, but otherwise, no, it's just a case. I, I, and I always say the same to my opponent. They say, do you want to see my list? And I say, no, mate, I, you've got British. I know what it is. Just when I shoot it, tell me what better it is so I know what to kill it on. And that's that's pretty much it. Because like the overthinking thing at the start, if you read his list and you think too much about it, yeah. you think, oh, well, what if this does this? And what if that does that? Well, I don't care mm. well because you may have all these plans in your head and then he deploys something and you think well why has he put that there yeah. and he makes a mistake early doors but you if you worry too much about the list you'll miss things like that so i need mm. to try and keep as clear ahead as possible so that the only thing i'm thinking of is where i need to deploy stuff so i've got good lanes of fire good lanes of crossfire the opportunity to move into position to set up ambushes where i want to have an overwhelming flank so that i can force the opponent down one side or into the middle where i can use my firepower to keep them locked in mm. so I, d I don't need to know what you've got you know uh, just as long as you tell me what kind of tank you've got so yep. i know it's whether it's a daca stewart or you've taken a lee or mm. uh, an aa crusader tank that's the only variation that i need to know about otherwise it's just infantry and transports and yep. you know you once it's on the board you then make up your plan because you know no, no plan survives contact with the enemy right so it never as, never does yeah as soon as they put their first couple of units down then you can start to think right now i can see what he's going to be doing with this list mm. and you know again nine times out of ten once once you've got the first deployment bit down or you've completed your first turn so you see where the enemy is 
you if you've played in a fault action you know what they're going to do you mm. know that if they get the first order dice that's going to activate or this is going to activate and you just need to be prepared for countering that so mm. it, you know i build my list to have dice supremacy so that i can force the opponent down before yep. they can do what that what i know they're going to do which is which is pretty much what you what you do when you have high order dice lists. Do you uh, because you all also play Finns? That is not a yeah. high order dice uh, army to play no. at all. So you you must be able to play different styles of play here. But do you find that that, that that's difficult to switch between those two? It is a little bit, yeah. So <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, if you're coming off the back of a tournament with Americans or you've played a lot of Americans for, you know, two, yeah. three, four months, you're going to be in that, especially for my list that I write for my Americans, you're going to be in that, got to get forward, got to hit them, got yeah. to put loads yeah. of pins everywhere, ah, charge. Um, you know, you got to imagine that the enemy's guarding an oil well and you need to bring them some <laughs> liberty. Um, yeah. But for my Finns, it's, it's a little tricky to immediately switch over yeah. because obviously your first instinct will be move up, shoot, but mm. your your Finnish army is very much. It, it, we've, we we always say that you need to see the matrix with Finns. Yeah. You need to be able to see if you move somewhere how it's going to affect something three or four order dice down the line. Yeah. And if you've not got that foresight, if you've not got that, you know, people that play chess have got that kind of gift. People that play snooker or mm. pool have got that kind of gift because you need to be planning three, four, five, six, seven shots ahead. And yep. Finns is very much an army like that. If you, mm. you need to be able to move your squad, ambush it, because you know, again, again, this comes with knowledge of what your opponent's play style is going to be and what you think they're going to do with their orders. You think, well, if I move it here, he's going to move that squad over here, then that squad yep. over here. And then once that activates, I can ambush it. It'll be on twos to hit and I'll just... Yep cut through the whole squad immediately and I'll use this tank over here as my second activation to force the issue by planting it on this side. So yeah. it, it is really hard to swap between a hyper aggressive army like the Americans or yeah. say for instance a Japanese Bandai horde where you're you have one activation on your order dice and that's run. Yeah. Um but for the Finns, yeah, it's it's hard. You need to be able to change it up. You need to be able yeah. to take a step back and yeah. think, well I don't need to, the, the, the missions aren't usually won in the first three or four to game, uh, three or four turns, nope. but they can certainly be lost. And Finns is one if, where if, if you, you throw away incorrectly of, or yeah. Yeah. If you throw yeah. away a couple of units early doors as Finns, yeah. then you may as well pack up your bags and go home because it yeah. needs everything to work in perfect harmony. Mm. Um, so it's it is hard to switch over but if you can if you see the matrix and you can flip over eventually fins are lethal i, I still yeah. maintain they are probably the most brutal army in bolt action if they work I they agree. are ruthless and yes. if they don't work or you can't see the matrix and you can't get it into your head what needs to happen three or four down the line you'll never or you, get or fins. you can't get the you terrain or or the opponent has like a little bit uh ahead of you is a little bit ahead of you in those chess moves yeah as soon as that happens you're going to lose with fins and it's going to go yeah. rapidly downhill that's my experience at, at least yeah yeah they, they really are an exponential curve both yes. for winning and losing yes. if you, it kind Definitely. of starts like this and then if you yep. start winning it goes whoosh and if you start yep. losing it also goes whoosh yep. um but they're hard to play they really yep. are but yeah i mean for my americans my japanese and my belgians they're all kind of aggressive armies mm. um so so finnish is one that i wanted Just to try different and kinds myself. of aggressive right <laughs> yeah. yeah different kinds one is relying on getting loads of pins mm. with the americans and pinning units out and forcing them to take morale checks with lots of uh, negative modifiers yeah. the japanese and the belgians or french in this case it was very much a case of pin them back in terms mm. of put in a couple of pins here and there but having overwhelming numbers so that once you make contact you pick off one unit and then the next and then the next and then the next yeah. or yeah. you know you may lose a couple of dice yourself but guess what you've got 23 left over and you can just do it again and again and mm. go full infantry wave um 
but yeah, Finns is very hard. It's a it's a very rewarding army to play because yep. if you do get it right, you think, oh, yes, oh, this is the best. Yeah, yeah. You you always feel like you're playing yep. points down as well. Yep. You always feel like you're playing, you know. But you are. I mean, you're thousand. always you're always at least two order dice lower than whatever you're facing. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. So. Yeah. it's really hard it's really hard to explain what you need to do and when because like with the americans you can guide people you can mm. say well what you should do mate is you should move these squads to this flank and use lots of bars yeah. and rifles to put pins yeah. on but for the Finns, you can't explain to someone why you need to move that unit into the trees on ambush and mm. it's like well why there's nothing there but it's like ah but wait it's gonna be <laughs> In th in two turns when he fires yeah. that howitzer you yeah. can go down and then use your tr your you know your, your vickers t26 to go around the flank and shoot it so that it's activated yeah. and it can't go down anymore and it's like oh yeah mm. but that's four order dice away and yeah. it's it's hard to see that you won't get a reward a reward for your activation immediately yeah so it's hard yeah yeah right i had a plan for for this i had a whole bunch of questions um right um so going into a game there there are like you said you said it yourself for the wtc we have basically three types of game there were placement games there were kill point games and there were objective games yeah um how do you plan to win each of those type of games um so for kill points games i always look for the enemy's weakest part mm. and then i just focus every single shot that i physically can on that part so for instance if you've got weapons teams like mortars if you've got easy kills like trucks mm. if you've got officers that are for some reason stood in the open or so, stood somewhere i can snipe them nice and easy artillery that's not placed in cover or is placed in light cover so that it's easy to hit yeah. i always pick that area of the army and I go after it hammer and tongue so that mm. you try and get two, three, four dice up as early as possible, because then you've I would never play like this. But you've then got the luxury of just going down for the entire game yes. and doing nothing. Personally, yeah. I think that makes a boring or, or at game. Least, or at least sitting back a little bit and not being as aggressive, right? Because yeah. now the enemy has to come to you. Yeah. And then once you've got that head of steam, you mm. can then split your army in half and then just say well you focus on that side you focus on that side and you kind of play two games at once yeah. and you can you can usually pick apart an army once you've got three or four dice ahead you for yeah. for objective games and for games like sectors i worry about the mission the first four turns the only thing i do is think how do i kill dice yeah. Because if you kill dice, it doesn't matter what they've got. They can't get anything. You know, mm -hmm. if, if it's an objective game, if you've taken half of their army, they yep. can't sit on objectives. Yep. If it's a sector's mission, for instance, if you kill a bunch of dice, not only are you getting points for doing so, you also deprive them of the score they would get for being in a sector. So yep. I, I don't care about objective missions and I don't care about sectors for the first four turns of the game. At the end of turn four, I then take stock of what's on the board, where everything is, and think, right, I need to get this here in two turns. How do I do that? Mm. And then I always come up with a plan for at least having two units for every objective. Or I think, well, I need to get over to this section of the board. Everyone has to run this turn, get behind cover, hide over there. And then next turn, you're scoring, you can go down, you're safe. And I've won the game that way. Yep. Um, yeah, basically, I pay kill points and then three or four turns of kill points and then worry about the mission because it's it's a lot easier to take objectives when the enemy has nothing left. And most it's, players it's also a lot easier to to freak your opponent out when they start losing the order dice, isn't it? Yeah, most players will think, oh, there's an objective there. I need to go and yeah. get on it so yeah. that I'm on it ready. And it's like. Yeah, but it's turn two, mate. Mm. You could just ignore me and actually use that unit to kill some of my stuff. And most players will focus on the victory conditions of a mission mm. rather than what will get you to an easier winning state. So you've yeah. got you've got two things. You? You've got a winning state where you think 
turn four and five, if I do X, I will win the game. Mm. And it's a lot easier if your opponent has half an army. Um, but most think the winning conditions are you need to be on one, two, three objectives across the middle, charge forward and get on the objectives. Yep. Well, you've charged forward. Now I can shoot you and you're yep. closer and I'm going to kill you easier. Just hold back. Think about how you can get to that turn four victory condition thingy rather than actually just charging headlong and doing what you would normally do. So do you find like I often do that, like turn four and five, suddenly the game turns really bloody, like everyone starts dying all of a sudden at that point in the game? No, because by then you see it's it's too late. Mm. If you've got to that point, I always find like that that's what my game against felix was like yeah our game was a draw because mm. there was one central objective and we had everything pointed at it at yep. the end of turn four and that's when it got really bloody so it was yeah. i kill a unit he kills a unit i kill a unit he kills a unit but by that point you see that's already the it's already gone past the point of no return you've got the only hope you've got is to get on that and hope mm. the time runs out yeah. because you've not got a contingency plan yeah. you need to remove all of those threats in the first three turns so that on turn four and five you can think to yourself you well all up. i've got to do yeah. is kill one unit and then i'll just walk the officer onto the objective and i win the game yeah. simple yeah. but a lot of people don't do that a lot of people take their time posture up get ready so that turn three they go right we'll engage now mm -hmm. but you've still got a full army to fight and that's yeah. not what you want to do you know, if you remove all of the snipers and the mortars and the weapons teams and stuff for the first two turns, guess what can't run onto those objectives turn five and contest them? Mm. If you wipe out the trucks early doors, guess what has to then walk across the board whilst your guns are opening fire and able to clear off them because they've now not got a transport to get where they need to be quickly and safely? Yeah guess whose artillery is completely inefficient if it's already dead turn one because they didn't deploy it 100 percent correctly and your dacker tank rolled on and just went yeah. nah get off the board mate lamb yeah yeah it's the only it's the, one of the only threats that most armies have mm. so you, you always try and kill the threats and new to the opponent before you worry about the objectives or sectors because by that point if like my french list for instance in my sector game which was turn one or game one sorry I killed four or five units and then just walked around the back of the trees on each quarter and then just <laughs> hid there. And then turn five, I just ran into his deployment zone. But I'd done yeah. the hard work by killing the four or five units early doors. I was already seven or eight dice up on him. Add the five or add the five that I've just got. And then I just, I walked into his point zone. I, I scored like 54 points that mission. It was crazy. And he got like wow. seven. Yeah, <laughs> wow. it, it, it was horrendously bad. But yeah. because I'd done the prep work to kill his army and soften it up beforehand. Yeah. If it had just been a, you walk into my objectives, I walk onto yours and see what happens, then that fight goes completely differently. Yeah. So here at the end, let's let's just look back to, to Welsh Nationals. Uh, what do you think actually decided that tournament for you? Uh, was there like one point in one game or what, what, uh, what do you think? No. It was decided by the list that I brought. Yeah. Because I knew exactly what I was going to play. Mm. I knew pretty much who I would play. Um, because you know which players are going, yeah. you know they're yeah. taking bricks, you, they're gonna and do you know who's going to be list. in the top ten as the, like it's, it's yeah, you know. Yeah. I I knew Toph would be around the top. I knew yeah. Gary and Rich and yeah. Wickens and Russell would all be around the top ten. I knew yeah. they'd all be taking British or some variant of it. So I built my list to kill it because yep. why why yep. wouldn't I do that? That's just common yep. sense, right? Um, so yeah, I, I don't want to again. I don't want to sound arrogant, but I I knew I was going to be in with an amazing chance to win the event just because of the list I took against mm. what I knew what was going. Yeah, yeah, right. So what is next for you? Like you're pretty much out of version two now. And uh, that means that this fall, we're going to just sit around waiting for version three. Unfortunately, yes. Um, yeah. The old world is out. So I am currently painting Bretonians. I'm hoping to go to a couple of old world tournaments just to keep the competitive juices flowing. 
Yeah. Because I am part of the like the Osprey reveal club, mm. we're hoping to get V3 early um, so that I can play test it in the background and get the WTC pack written. Yeah. Because obviously I think it's about this time next year that the WTC happens. Yeah. So the earlier I can get hold of that, the better. Um, the better for you guys that are going to be competing, the better yes. for me because I need to memorize every single word of that book so that there's no rules questions we're but gonna it's... game the shit out of it oh don't yeah you, it... don't you worry <laughs> it's warlord writing mate i know yes, this yes, rule book yes. is going to be absolute <laughs> trash um but in terms of v2 now we're mm. done until yep. v3 comes out you know like i said earlier i've done everything i need to do i've won loads of gts i've won loads of yep. events i've competed at the wtc there's nothing it, left yeah. for me to tick off for, mm. for v2 now so we're just patiently waiting now until v3 comes out we might have a kick around game every now and again at club yeah. just to yeah. you know scratch the itch so to speak mm. um but yeah we're just waiting for v3 and hope it's a good one right right that was it dan uh thank you so much is there any like advice you would give to beginning players right now p people who want to go to tournaments and and start that competitive uh bolt action thing yeah yeah uh, two two bits of advice and mm -hmm. one of them is going to sound like i'm uh, being an idiot um <laughs> and that is take a big bottle of water yeah honestly but bolt action is a it's not like 40k where no. you can just sit there and just daydream look yeah. around at the ceiling look at the dog taking a way outside against the lamppost and disengage from the game from for 40 minutes because it's not your turn bolt action is constantly back and forth and back and forth and you're talking all the time yeah so it's a really mentally stressful game especially if you're up against a good player mm. or if you're in a really tight scenario or a really tight situation and you think you might lose you need to be able to focus and staying hydrated is the number one thing like yeah i i swear by it i always take a big bottle of juice mm. and i have that for all of the games and i try and drink at least half a bottle maybe even a full bottle for every single game because it just keeps your brain topped up and it keeps you yeah. At, the, at the peak and also eat loads of fruit during the day as well um bananas and apples are your best bet just to mm. keep your brain going keep everything ticking over um and then my second bit of advice would be if you're starting out take a notebook and yeah. write down everything yeah. that happens good or bad when yeah. i first started out i would i used to do this i used to think about my list and on the back of my list i would write this unit is shit mm. <laughs> or this didn't work or that tactic yeah. didn't work and i tell you what after a, after a few games of leaving stuff in outflank and reserving it guess mm. what outflank and reserves don't fucking work yeah. <laughs> and it's absolutely useless why yeah. play points down but mm. you don't know that no until you do these things so take an army and you know during the day if you've got a three game take event notes. just yeah just put a little score as to how you feel each of the units mm. performed you know if you've got a daka stewart just mark it out of five game one two and three if you've got mm. an engineer squad in a dodge truck with a machine gun on it how did that combo work how did that unit work if you if you're having units that are performing well but you're still losing games well what why did that do happen yeah. with your army to make yeah. support those units that are doing well mm. ask your opponent you know we've had loads of i've had lots and lots and lots of people that i've beaten during a tournament just come up to me and say well what would you have done different at the end of that yeah. or how would you have approached that game where well, you can see well personally mate and again my play style is different to your play style it's different to russell's to toves mm. to wiccans you know we all play slightly differently yeah i would say in my play style in my opinion i would have done x y and z yeah and you may look at me and think what are you talking about that is clearly inefficient but take the note of what the person says 
and go and try what they're saying in the next game. Yeah. If your army performs worse, then you go, well, that's clearly not a tactic that I can adopt. Mm. I will go back to the drawing board and we'll try and figure something else out. Or I'll try this thing from game two that someone else said and yeah. see how that works. But yeah. you've always got to take feedback. because I mean, one of my first events ever was V1 and it was the Warlord GT. Yeah. And it was I'd, I'd been playing bolt action for about six weeks at that point. And yeah. I went and I got a lucky win first game got absolutely smashed in my second game and absolutely smashed in my fourth game. Yeah. But since then, at every GT, WTC, Open, every mm. major event that I've ever been to, I have never lost a game since then. Yeah. And that's in, what, seven, eight years now of V2? All because I did the prep at the start. I take notes yeah. of what's going on. I look at my list and how it's performing. I think about how the synergies are working between the combat like if unit a and unit b work together how do they work and mm. doing the prep beforehand really does make a difference and it then does. getting feedback after the game from your opponent to see yeah. if you've done something wrong what would you have done differently mate especially from people like myself people like you mm. veteran players that would would be near the top of the event anyway just ask yeah. for their advice and it, it does yeah. it does work it does. I agree. That is good advice. Thank you so much for coming on, Dan. I hope everyone pleasure, learned Brian. something here today. Uh, <laughs> less uh, bantery than the Jugger podcast, but I hope you can live with that, Dan. Oh, uh, if it, you know, you always hear about these people that, oh, if I could influence one person, it will make me happy. You know? and <laughs> yeah. The Jugger podcast audience is about four people. So, you know, if, if we can influence one person <laughs> from this video and they, become a slightly better bolt action player um that's always we, good, yeah. we've no yeah we've noticed over the past couple of major events in the uk the pool of good players has grown used yes, it used it to be about five or six players that would just if yeah. they were at an event and you're not one of them you may as well go home because yeah. they're going to steamroll you but yeah. there were a lot of players at the welsh over uh, welsh nationals that were near the top that i hadn't seen at other events before and when i played a couple of them they were very good players yeah. Uh, so hopefully this helps other players to grow to be like that as well and helps them to get better at the game. Let's hope so. Yeah. Anyway, that was it from us today. Thank you all for tuning in and we will see you next time.